I would like to invite at this stage, and we are very glad to be with us, that the director of the Millennium Project, this is quoted uh, number one uh, think tank, foresight think tank in the world, uh, Jerome C. Glenn, that is with us uh, to deliver a speech on challenges of cities uh, in the future and how we can act now. So, Jerome, please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. It is a beautiful city. You've made everybody else in the world jealous, you know that. <laughs> uh, I want to quickly go through a lot of things. Uh, the future's big. It's going to be not going to be covered in 20 minutes or 25 minutes, but we'll try. Uh, one of the first things that I would suggest on uh, investing to improve the urban situation in the future is collective intelligence systems. Uh, the speaker from Microsoft had pointed out the explosion of knowledge. It's also the efficiency of bandwidth to get more knowledge through. More and more people participate in it, which explodes the content as well. It's going to be in transmedia systems, so the complexity is absolutely overwhelming. How do we wrap our minds around all of that? The old systems are not going to do it. Are not, are not doing it, actually. When you consider the amount of breakthroughs in engineering every month, it's staggering. Even in a simple category like solar photo photovoltaic cells, there's different mixes almost every month of efficiency. So you decide you're going to do, make the city more solar uh, sources. What systems do you pick? You may make a decision that was a year old, and then it's going to take you a year to build, so you're two years out of date, rather than how, to, how you keep up with it. It's, it's, it's a tough, tough job. So collective intelligence system ought to be in every mayor's office and available to the people as well. Uh, it's a participatory system. I'll get into that a little bit later, but collective intelligence, in my judgment, is the next big thing in ICT. Institutionally, trans institutions. We know that public-private partnerships are a good idea. But they're not an entity themselves. We need to create a trans institution as an entity itself. And I'll get into that a little bit later. So it's not simply because in a public private partnership, you go home at the end of the day. We have private companies, we have nonprofit uh, companies, for profit, nonprofit. Third category, trans institutional category. And I'll get into that. It's a more efficient way of doing business than the other institutional categories. It's the way the Millennium Project is organized. That's why we're so efficient because of that structure. University courses. All of the universities around the world should be offering urban systems ecology. We know this intellectually, but how many courses in urban systems ecology are taught in your universities? Anybody? I hope within a couple of years all the hands go up. We people have to understand how to run our cities as an integrated urban entity, as if it was a living organism. We know the interdependency of the body. Imagine if we just ran our body from our circulatory system. We'd be, it wouldn't work as well. We need to treat our body as an integrated system Retrofit all of the buildings, we know this, uh, but we're not going as fast as we should. Dynamic adaptive building with sensors. This is where Microsoft and Siemens and all the rest of the corporations will come to work to, and help you out on that. So buildings and cities themselves start to diagnose themselves and fix themselves. Ubiquitous computing or Internet of Things, robotics, nanosensors for better management of counterterrorism. Ter terrorism so far has not gone away. One of the biggest security issues in the world is what we call CMAD, single, individual, massively destructive. It is not impossible that eventually an individual acting alone can make a microbe to wipe out more than you're willing to believe. That's not impossible. Just as thermonuclear war was not impossible, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen because of a lot of reasons. Because the history of warfare, whatever has been used or invented, has been used. And when you have great powers, they fight. The Cold War was the first time of that turn of history. We were successful so far. <laughs> now we got another one, and that's a single individual message. How are we going to handle that idea? Well, one part of it, of the answer, not the whole part, is how do we create the sensors to monitor every 
change of specific molecular structures in public spaces. That's an assignment we're going to have to do. Greening of everything. Whatever it is, just imagine greening it. Smart things like smart traffic control. I see Siemens got the smart cities here. And a key issue is water across all the cities of the world, or most of the cities. Two elements on that that, that I think will make a big impact that's, that's not being addressed but should be invested in. One is making meat without animals. Everybody knows that the majority of land and water is used in agriculture. Well, plurality of land, not the majority of land, but the majority of the water is used for agriculture. The majority of all of that is used for making food for animals. And those animals sometimes give us diseases. And we import them across borders, it's expensive, and they've got problems. We know that we can make meat without growing animals. It's been done. You can do a computer search on this. It's not going to be a T-bone steak yet. But you can take pure meat and add it to hot dogs and add it to hamburgers and so forth now. That can be done now. Now, that reduces the drain of water to free up water for agriculture, uh, free up uh, for, for, for urban, urban use of it. Another is seawater agriculture. There's about 10,000 species that can grow in salt water or salt, uh, high salt areas. Along the coastline around the world, we can put cuts. Montenegro can do well on this. <laughs> put cuts. And then you irrigate with salt water. You can grow shrimp. The waste from the shrimp can go to feed the algae. The algae can go to that. And you can go on and on and on. Tremendous possibilities for changing the water consumption in the world. The number one problem farmers have in the world is rain. The United States, as we know, has gone through a serious problem with rain. All right, in seawater agriculture, rain doesn't matter. You eliminate the number one problem in agriculture, rain. Because you've got salt water, you're irrigating with it. There's not a shortage of salt water in the world. Ah, now, Rio plus 20. To me, there is two key stories. One was the recognized failure of nation states. You know, we've always had this hope, the nation state's going to do it, and we keep coming to these meetings. And we get more disappointed, and we get more disappointed, and we get more disappointed. And I think Rio 20 was the, was, the, was the point of inflection. We are saying that nation states are not going to get it done. So who is? The, all those side meetings in Rio 20, it's the meetings of the businesses, the universities, and the NGOs, and mayors, and, and municipals. That synergy can act. If the nation state isn't doing it, we have to do something else. That I think is the lesson from Rio 2020. So where's the whole system going? One, we are integrating on our bodies and in our bodies micro-miniaturized technology that's intelligent. We will become cyborgs increasingly. A cyborg is a human dependent upon technology for vital functions. That is increasing year after year. I used to keep track of the patents. Now I don't do it. It's, it's, it's an inevitable direction. Now, how aesthetic it is, that's our freedom. How we work it out, that's our freedom. But that we will be dependent on vital functions for technology is a done deal. That's the direction. It's very clear. Same time, our physical environment is becoming more and more intelligent. With sensors, you take your shirt off, put it in your hotel room, and it says, hey, hang me up. We'll talk to everything, and everything will talk to us. It'll be our, the whole environment will be a conscious partner. These two trends will blur. And eventually, we'll enter a, what we call a conscious technology age, where the distinction between human consciousness and technology will be too difficult to make it a, a separation and a distinction from. And you won't worry about it. You'll be an integrated whole system. Now, as brains are connections of nerve cells, so too cities should be thought of as connection of brains. We don't manage cities yet, in my knowledge, as a management system of brains. How do we manage brains? How well cities give coherence, I like coherence was one of the European priorities there. How well cities give coherence to these brains to address global challenges will determine the future quality of our cities. That's the bottom line. Now, how are we going to do this? One approach, as I mentioned, is collective intelligence. Collective intelligence is not simply taking all of the ideas in the room and then adding them up and say, there's the answer. 
Collective intelligence is more like a brain. We take all of the stuff of the brains in the room and we have feedback back and forth so that we take the best part of you, the best part of you, the best part of you and put the synergies of them together, not just averaging them together. How do we then, that, then an intelligence that emerges from the group is not simply adding all the brains together. It's the synergies among those. And in a collective intelligence system, it should be human brains plus the hardware software plus the data information knowledge such that each can change the other. If you can't change a thing in a system, it's not part of a collective intelligence system. So by collective intelligence, sorry for the academic definition, but for the university folks here, what do I mean? I mean it's an emergent property. It emerges from the synergy. Just like your mind emerges from what you had for breakfast, this lousy speaker you're listening to, your genetic inheritance, all of that stuff together emerges your mind and is constantly changing all the time. So collective intelligence is an emergent property from the synergies among data information knowledge, hardware, software, experts and others with insight that continually learns from feedback, not just getting the feedback, but responding. If you just get feedback, it's information overload. You've got to respond to the feedback to produce nearly just-in-time knowledge for better decision than these uh, elements acting alone. In the old days, you bring the wise people together, you have a discussion, and you get a decision, right? Then along comes Microsoft and the rest of these guys, and they say, well, you don't have to do that. You just search the internet, you get the answer. Then, of course, a couple of mathematicians in the group said, wait a minute, I have better decision-making software, right? So all three of them should be interacting so that each improves the other on an ongoing, continuous basis. We're building, we built one for the, Korea, for the Kuwait uh, Prime Minister's office, one in Korea is on, collective on, uh, uh, ener on energy and environment, sustainable development. We're doing one ourselves. Just to give, there's different ways of doing this, but just to give you an idea of what they're like. Um, let's say you take a challenge like sustainable development and climate change. All right? Everybody's got to keep track of that. How do you keep track of all the ideas? So we're saying one is you have a little display chart right there where it says show controls. That's because I do the programming so it shows up on mine. But where it says current situation, we as human beings should know what is important to know now. And we can have an argument and discussion about that. And we can keep changing what we think are the important things to keep track and the information. At the same time, what's the desired situation? We can go through conversations on that. And then what are the policies to address the gap? And then we can argue about that and what are the best approaches. So the situation chart, this first part up here, that should be changing all the time, just like your mind is changing all the time. Over in the right hand, we've got the normal sort of a scanning system. Then down on the left hand side there, you've got the discussion so that if something's important that a mayor's office wants to bring up, he or in a citizen for that matter, can add into there and say, here's an issue we as a people need to discuss. On the right, lower right hand side of the feeds, this is a constant news feed, what's the most important news sources for your city? You should have that. You should have that going all the time. Then you can have staff and other people going through that news on a regular basis, then bringing it into the scanning system. And those things in the scanning system that are really important to discuss, you bring it into discussion. When you get those agreements on policy, you put it in the situation chart. The situation chart may have an error in it or something that needs to be looked at. So then you, these systems keep going back and forth. Up on the top of it, you'll see where it says main. Main is that what you're just seeing here. Then you have summary, which is the content. So all the content you need to keep track of is there. Discussion is in there. Situation chart, scanning, news, computer models. What are the most important computer models for you to be using all the time? How can they be interactive? Those can be changed. What are the best resources, the best books, the best articles, the best websites? And those can be changing all the time. So that's a quick overview. Now, the agenda for us as human beings, 15 global challenges, this came through a long set of processes I won't bore you with, but this is what we have to do. The first, of course, you're all aware of, sustainable development and climate change. Next, this is not an order of priority, by the way. It's just like the human body, the heart is not more important than the brain. The circulatory system is not more important than the skeletal system, all right? But there, we human beings have to list things, so we are listed first, sustainable development. Two, clean water. The water tables are going down around the world. We got another two billion people coming up in just 38 years. In just 38 years, two billion people. 
A hundred years ago, the population was 1.6 billion people. We're going to have more than the entire population of the Earth just a hundred years ago, added in just 38 years. So whatever you're looking at the future, imagine everything being a third more crowded, third more demand. That's a generalization. So the water requirements, more. Population and resources. How do we bring those into balance? How can we bring governance and new management systems to make genuine democracies? Whoops. How can we integrate long-term global perspectives into our decision making? We all know that we make decisions in cities that get overruled by events in the world. Right? So we have to have systems in the mayor's office to keep track of all of these global systems. How does it affect us every day? How does it affect us every day? Global convergence of information and technology is going at a rapid pace, but how do we make it work for everybody so it's not just a resource for terrorists, but a resource to make us more intelligent? One of the things I'd like to suggest to Microsoft, as well as to uh, ministries of education, is that increasing intelligence should be a goal of education. Right now, around the world, to my knowledge, there's not one country in the world that has in their mission statement for a Ministry of Education, increase intelligence. We know the world's getting more complex. We know we're moving into more knowledge-based economies. Therefore, let's get that capital, this thing, improved. We've learned a lot about cognitive science. I have yet to meet a teacher who can tell me how they integrate what we're learning about cognitive science and brain research, how they integrate that into the classroom. We are not educating kneecaps. We are not educating earlobes. We are not ed educating our feet. We are educating our brain. Now, we know about bodybuilding, right? There's bodybuilding clubs all around the world. Where's the brain building clubs? OK. Uh, rich, poor gap. We know that the free market within rules is a driving force of economic growth. How can we make this a more, more ethical system to connect up the rich and the poor into an integrated uh, strategy. We cover all of these in great detail, but we don't have time for that. Health issues, new diseases on average, one a year is emerging. This is serious. Not to mention the bioterrorism addition to it. As we concentrate people into urban environments, we're moving those little microbes a little faster than we moved them before. So new diseases is going to be a serious issue. Re-emerging old, disease, old diseases is also happening. And because of the rapid use of drugs and their overuse of drugs, we've got a lot of diseases like TB. We now have TB now that's drug resistant. You put these three things together, add in the bioterrorism, this is also an issue that urban environments have to address. There's new security strategies being learned all the time, not being employed. How do we address that one? We know that as the status of women improve in, in economics and in business and in politics, the standard of living of the country goes up. It's one of the best investments you can make, is getting the women involved into business and into politics. Um, energy uh, or organized crime. This is the, as we've often said in my country, this is the 800-pound gorilla in world affairs. You take all the military budgets in the world, it's about $1.3, $1.4 trillion. By our calculation, organized crime is twice that. Take the entire military infrastructure of the world, including veterans' hospitals, benefits, training programs, all that together, battleships, rocket ships, satellites, all together, that's half the cash value of organized crime. We don't address organized crime. Democracy is a joke. Now, throw in some election changes in the United States, and you can see that organized crime can buy an election, legally. We, got this, we made this decision last year, letting people buy, you know, bring that in. You're talking about before go, go, different countries influencing it. Organized crime now can do it. There is a global strategy 
in, that are being discussed around the world where there is, there's answers to these things. By the way, I don't mean to depress you. The good news is there's a lot of answers to these things. That's why we need a collective intelligence to, to go over those answers, feedback, and then act together in a more coherent fashion. Energy has already been addressed a couple times. One of the things that the European uh, Space Agency has looked at several times and is getting close to making a decision is the idea of collaborating with the United States, Japan, and China on creating solar power satellites. Japan has already agreed by 2030 and China by 2040. Because you may not know that you can make a satellite with little wings on it and when you make a telephone call and it comes down to another country, you use a little electricity on that satellite. That little electricity comes from photovoltaic cells. Well, we can make large ones, put them around the whole world, and we can give equal access to electricity to Montenegro, to Sudan, and New York City equally. Just as the same way we have telephony, telephony can go up and down equally around the world. It's just a form of energy. Now, think of how many energy interests that bypasses. The technology has been known since the 70s. I'm not suggesting that this is going to be done, but if it is, it erases the problem of nuclear waste in the long term. And it erases the problem of greenhouse gases long term. Now, we're not going to go to that system tomorrow morning, but I think that's a long-term direction. Because we can also take the surplus power out of, let's say, France from nuclear power plants at nighttime, microwave up the satellite and give that somewhere else. So we can just have a relay system around the world. These bold new answers are going to be important if we don't really do a good job on efficiency. However, energy efficiency is going faster and faster than most people realize. We may not have the big electricity demand that people are talking about in 50 years because of these efficiencies. We may be able to run the electricity for our communications devices, our computer devices, and so forth off of the heat and friction of our bodies. We're learning how to do this. Now, it's hard to believe that in 25 years we will not have learned how to do that even more efficiently. So the energy demand is a very open question how much we'll really have to do because of the efficiencies. Science and technology, how can we make that better? New innovations, science to a large degree is managed by the management of ideas. A dumb research project doesn't get you much. A smart research project does. So science by itself is not divorced of what the hypothesis is. How we organize the best ideas of all of us in the world will improve science for all of us together. Global ethics. We know that the financial crisis of the world was caused by a lot of unethical decisions. So ethics and business, you know, done deal. We know we have to have ethic, moral business. And anybody that says otherwise, slap them. <laughs> we can't go through this nonsense again. Okay. The key element here is that if I look at the global trends, the prices of food, water, and energy continue to go up to an unsustainable and politically unacceptable level. A study in the United States and a study in the UK concluded about half the world is, is potentially unstable. This is about four or five years ago. And you'll notice that the instability is going up. Because of demographics in certain parts of the world, you've got a large number of youth that are unemployed, angry, and we're just beginning that social unrest. So we have to change the basis of food, water, and energy for the world to prevent that conflict. For example, if you take a look, here's something like 16 or 17 factors that influence the price of food. All of those are going in the wrong direction. All of them. We don't have time to hang out. We have to change the energy base of the world. Meat without animals is one part of it. Saltwater agriculture is another part of it. We have to change the food and energy base of the world. We know this. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the nation states are not getting the job done. So it's going to have to be the kind of thing that's being done at this conference. Business, universities, NGOs, and mayors and cities. That's going to be the muscle that's going to turn this thing around. Now, organization, I mentioned the trans institution as a new kind of institutional structure. The trans institution does not exist legally as such. We have for profit, we have non profit, we do not have trans institution yet. Trans institution means four things. One, whatever the governing body, it has to have 
elements from government, universities, uh, corporations, UN or international agencies in there. The people have to come from those categories, but not a majority of anyone. The income should come from all those categories, but not a majority of anyone. The products should ser or services should serve all those categories, but not a majority of anyone. Now, one of the reasons for this is when you do something, whatever you do as a trans institution. Now, you remember, this, this becomes a new category. So any legislature can pass a law saying, we got these two categories, for-profit, non-profit, and then trans institution. If they do that, and you do those categories, you're a trans institution. A trans institution means you have to have your actions together to meet the bottom line, because business is there. It has to make sense politically, because government politicians are there. It has to make sense internationally, because the international organization in the UN is there. It has to make sense uh, values, because the NGOs are there. It has to make sense for knowledge, because the universities are there. Now, I speak from experience, because the Millennium Project that I run is organized as a trans institution. Now, we have to be registered as a nonprofit because I don't have a choice. But I can tell you from experience, the United Nations University evaluated us about 10 or more years ago. And one of the key conclusions was there's no, they, they couldn't understand how we could be so effective on such a small budget. Because when we needed to be business, we're business. When we need to be government, we're government. When we needed to be UN, we're UN. When we need to be university, we're university. That gives us a flexibility that normal systems don't have. If you work for government, well, some people do government and university at the same time, but not too many. <laughs> um, it's hard for you to be in all those categories at once. I mean, we're structured to have parallel categories. We're not structured to have synthesis systems. So that makes us more efficient. Now, a little bit on the future of management and how that stuff fits together. The conventional approach is the hierarchy. That's still the majority of the world, right? We all know this. We all live in that. Now, you have a meeting like this as a network. That cuts across all the hierarchies. Consider all the hierarchies we're all in in this room. Right? This meeting cuts across the information control of the hierarchy. That's a good thing. But it's like-minded people. We sort of all would agree that cities ought to be better managed and new approaches and more participatory. We all sort of agree with that. That's good. We're sharing stuff. That's a good idea. It's better than just hierarchy. But next step, integrate these different categories into a trans institution. We know that the, one of the values of a city to begin with, like why we have cities anyway, is to bring together different kinds of people. And it's that synergy that makes a city more intelligent than just being, no offense, but one farmer in one place. City integrates the, the people. Art gets created. Philosophy gets created. All of that stuff gets created. So imagine organization taking a lesson from that. Second. Then take different nodes. So I call a node. A node is an integration of two or more systems. All right. So then imagine you have alliances between two or so or three nodes. That creates a space that doesn't exist in the management structure as we know it today. Yesterday, we had a meeting of some Millennium Project node chairs and some European college folks together creating how we're going to act together. That doesn't fit in the normal management structure anywhere. Next, you can put these fields of play into relationships, and then Harvard Business School says, wait a minute, go back to networks. <laughs> you went too fast. This kind of direction is how you speed up things, because the normal decision-making processes we know are inefficient, not working. We have to go to new systems, and networking is just step two. We've got to slowly but surely move to step five. That's how you manage the world, in my judgment. Now, a quick think trick. Make a list of those things you think are the most important for your city, whatever they are, new technologies, new ideas, whatever in the future you think is really important to track. Make a little matrix like this, and then say, and then you, you put them down one side and then repeat them across the top and say, okay, how can this new element affect that new element? Because we all know things don't live in a vacuum. They do interact. And that's how when people say, I was surprised, they were surprised because they didn't think how this affected that. So how can you help yourself not be so surprised? Take all those things together, put them in a table, and cross-impact them. And you'll come up with questions and insights 
that I guarantee you, you've never had before. This, this is a good think trick. Now, in this situation, I just use it for ourselves, how do we improve efficiencies ab above the normal stuff? One, synthetic biology. We will make life forms far more efficient than the life forms we have today. We can take a life form eventually, and instead of having a, a little thing in our digestive system, taking care of our food, we can eventually possibly put it in our brain and get rid of the junk. So when you're 110 years old, you're as fresh as you were when you're 20. Why aren't you today? Because there's junk that builds up. We have microbes cleaning up our intestines. We could have microbes cleaning up our brains. Right? So imagine running a world where you have old people that are sharp as distinct from old people that are not. That's a simple one, applic one application of synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is you're taking part of genetic structures of different systems and you're creating something that's never been there before. This will probably be bigger than the Industrial Revolution, my guess, but we won't know that for 50 years. Nanotechnology, people are all familiar with that. 3D printing, the idea, instead of in the old days, you would say, ah, that's really cool, I like that. Where can I go buy that? In the future, you'll say, where do I download the software to print it in my basement? 3D printing, for those of you who don't know, 2D printing is like you print a paper, right? A little ink and so forth. So 3D printing, you either build up glue, clay, glue, clay, until you make a structure. Or you take a structure and you cut it down. There's two ways of doing it. Right? You can buy these things for uh, low prices, under $2,000 today. Not the great metal ones, they're still expensive. But you can make body parts, you can, eventually. You can make, unfortunately, guns. Individuals will have the power of the Industrial Revolution. Anyway, so you cross-impact these things, you'll get ideas. I guarantee you, you use this thing, you don't come up with an idea that you haven't thought about before, I'll buy you a dinner anywhere in the world. Okay, so the Millennium Project is organized this way with 46 nodes around the world. We have different configurations and this is how we work. We put it all into a state of the future report, stick it on, the, on a little flash drive so you can delete it if you don't like it and put your own stuff on. And that's all I have today and I wish you best of luck. I think what this conference is about is actually important, really important. If mayors can begin to collaborate, network fashion, build trans-institutional systems, and move on some of these other investments that don't normally get done, you will be the life that gets us to the next 25 to 50 years. Thank you.